Every week we do a Q&A with interesting and accomplished members of the adaptive community to find how they persevered, how they innovated, how they built communities, and how they found solutions. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast today. We are excited to have Jesper Pedersen, who is a mono skier from Norway, four-time globe winner, which means that he was the best mono skier in the world for four years in a row. That has never happened. He also is a gold and bronze medalist from the Pyeongchang Games. Looking forward to Beijing, which will be March 4th through 13th of this year, and also the World Championships, which will be in January in Lillehammer. Jesper, welcome. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. It's great to see you here. It's great to see how much you've done in terms of your skiing. But you're actually, you're a flatlander though, aren't you? You're, you're not from the mountains. No, I'm, that's something I hear quite often in Norway because I'm from like the coast, uh, the coastline. Uh, and uh, it's like two hours or something drive uh, from the mountains. Uh, and everybody asks me like, how I could be such a good skier coming from Kalme, as it's called there. Uh, and uh, yeah, but as long as you, you're devoted to what you're doing and you want to keep getting better, uh, you just have to spend those extra hours in the car and uh, find the mountains. But it's also, it's, it's a family passion, right? Your family had an apartment in the mountains. So, so it wasn't like you were just, you, you could go back and forth. You had those two years, but it's kind of like you grew up in a family that was a mountain passion family as well. Yeah, we had have had an apartment up in the mountains for quite some time. Uh, and my parents first took me out skiing when I was about two years old. Uh, so I've basically been skiing all my life. Uh, so it's been a big part of who I am as a person and uh, just uh, the feeling of freedom, not being uh, locked to the wheelchair, but uh, going up and out the mountains and uh, skiing faster than my friends and everything. It's just been amazing. <laughs> now you hit on a couple of things. One, the freedom. What's, what's the freedom? Why, why is skiing so freedom? And then I want to talk about you beating your friends too. Uh, I don't know. It's just something about the feeling of not being locked to a wheelchair, but be able to ski everywhere and not having any boundaries really. Uh, in when where we have the apartment in Norway, uh, it's called the deepest snow in Europe. Uh, so I've crashed a few times and kind of felt like I was drowning under the snow because it's so so deep powder. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's just amazing feeling to be able to do everything else that my friends did, and uh, also now skiing, uh, skiing professionally, like always wanting to be a bit better all the time uh, and not like uh, like thinking that I am as good as I could be, but always wanting to develop a bit more. Now you talked about that powder and for us powder, we're a little bit lower and deep powder can be a challenge. I, one of the biggest challenges, I remember skiing a couple of years ago and I was skiing powder and everything was great, but I was getting my mouth of snow yeah <laughs> and so so i could only breathe when i wasn't turning so it was like okay okay make a turn hold your breath and then and then okay you can breathe and then make another turn so you end up skiing powder a whole lot faster sometimes than you intend to yeah. ski if it's that deep yeah i know the feeling uh, so you just have to have like this wide ski uh, so you don't uh sink into the snow and just try to float and uh, ski a bit faster than you should probably because you have to you have to keep the speed to keep uh, staying above the snow exactly now you were saying that that you love skiing because you can ski with your friends and you can beat your friends is, is skiing really the place where where you had that that kind of feeling of being a peer of being an equal with your friends versus some of the other things that you encounter I would say skiing was one of many arenas, really, uh, because uh, growing, growing up, as we talked about, uh, away from the mountains, uh, I, uh, skiing wasn't like the most obvious thing to do. Uh, so I did kind of everything that my friends did uh, in my hometown, uh, in, 
in uh, child school, I remember being like goalkeeper in football uh, or soccer, as you call it, because uh, yeah, because uh, that was the position I could be in. Uh, and also, I played a lot of handball with my friends. I was probably the ones who shot the hardest uh, and uh, also played uh, some tennis and uh, table tennis and uh, swimming yeah and i think all those uh, things uh, where I, i'm not trying to like uh, distance myself from uh, my able-bodied friends but uh, try to do the same thing as them uh, but uh, maybe like you have to do something to make it happen uh, but uh, just uh, just a basic thought that you have to try to do things on their terms and not like you make them go on your terms. I think that's healthy. Yeah, you have to be a little bit more creative, right? And yeah. so how, how were you as a goalkeeper? I think I was quite good, actually. Uh, I had some uh, reaction skills. So, uh, so but uh, yeah, when the... When they, when they started playing on the big fields and stuff, uh, I started being a football referee. So I like tried to yeah do things my own way. And my parents have like taught me how to how to not see things as a problem, but more like a like a yeah a way to become a better person. Right, this opportunity to continue to grow as a person. Norway has an amazing history of ski racing. I mean, for a country that has a little bit more than 5 million people, I mean, you've got the Schuses and the Omots who what more, more Olympic and world championship medals than anybody. You've got Svindal, you've got Christofferson, you've got Jansrud. Uh, I mean, Botten went and won, or Broughton went and won, uh, sold in last year. You train with these guys though how does that work yeah i do uh here in oslo we we all train at the olympic training center uh, so i see them in my daily life uh, and it's just a mm, amazing thing to be like a part of the attacking vikings as we call ourselves and also in the ski camps we have some camps uh, early summer and uh, late summer where we train at the same places and together and that, like, I learn, learn things from them all the time. And I think they could benefit from seeing what's possible uh, by me as well. Uh, because, uh, yeah, I have a story with me and Axel uh, and uh, Jet Lianshrud skiing downhill. And then they want me to go first to set the line, kind of. So it's just, uh, it's just amazing to be a part of that team. And, like, both those guys are pretty decent downhill skiers. <laughs> so like being being the one that has to set the line uh, is uh, yeah, it just makes me feel like part of the team and i think it's made me yeah that's a good skier as i am today well i'd imagine it also is forcing you to up your game a little bit too if you have these guys following behind you you want to make sure you do it right i'm assuming <laughs> yeah of course they are the best and uh yeah, being able to train with them in the in my daily life has uh, made me see possibilities that I probably wouldn't have uh, figured out if I was like if we were only training with our team, uh, like the the sit skiers, because I think it's smart to train a bit. Uh, like gr growing up, I also trained with my local club, uh, and I was the only mono skier. Mm -hmm. So I think that's given me some p perspectives that's uh, useful now how, how is that perspective because I, I i think the same thing i'm interested to hear if, if we're because i mean one of the things is that we're all trying to do the same thing right i mean like as as skiers the, you want to make the ski turn you want to make the ski do what it's supposed to do so if you start from that part then you move up and it's like okay how are you as a mono skier achieving what an axle can do who's who's a big guy gigantic thighs you know this kind of stuff has a much bigger lever than you do but um but but it's also in some ways it's easier to see too isn't it easier to see like what's happening with them versus a mono skier because because we only have so much so much movement 
movement that we can put into it. We only have one joint. Is, is that the way it works for you being able to see those guys? And it probably raises you to a higher standard too, of just, you just do what they do. You just follow them in some ways. Yeah, you have some great uh, points there. Uh, I think uh, when new coaches see me for the first time, uh, they get like the whoa factor uh, and it doesn't like, they don't see what I'm working on uh, at first, uh, but then when they go a bit more in depth in what I'm doing on my ski, uh, they see that uh, the, the, yeah, the basic things is uh, mainly like the same thing things as the able-bodied guys work on uh, and of course uh, training a lot with able-bodied people I think I've uh, learned a lot about like how to set the line not going too high or not going too wide but like try to stay in their line uh, and uh, I I'm working on the same thing like getting over the ski and not leaning into the turn and yeah just the basic uh, alpine skiing stuff yeah, it's funny. I say to people all the time, skiing's a really simple sport yes. if you do it well. You know, it can be really <laughs> complex if you don't do it well. That's the that's the <laughs> biggest problem. Yeah. What's the interaction with those guys? Like, I mean, when you first came on board, you know, you first came to this camp and you're training with them. Are they, you know, were they embracing of you? Were they like, what's this guy doing here? Uh, what was the thought? Uh, I actually have a long story with them because uh, where we have the apartment, uh, they usually train every spring uh, before the snow leaves uh, the mountains. Uh, and uh, like when I was, I think from the age of nine, ten, uh, we we went up and uh, looked at them uh, while they trained. And uh, as I grew older and uh, and into a better skier, uh, I was allowed to train with them. Uh, so it's gone like they've seen me uh, ski uh, for many years and they know what I'm capable of doing. Uh, and now being incorporated in the same uh, Olympic training center and uh, like doing much of our stuff together with them. Uh, I think I think we can learn stuff uh, from both sides, not just me, but also them. Right. That they're seeing stuff that you're doing and, and incorporating that. I mean, that's that's the nature of being a ski racer, though, too, isn't it? That. I mean, it's a, it's a funny sport in some ways in that when you're ahead of somebody, you want to stay ahead of somebody, but you also can learn from people who are behind you because they might do something that then you can incorporate into your skiing that will, that will make you better. The team part of the attacking Vikings, as you said, is, is famous throughout World Cup skiing. I mean, just people, it, 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 it's such a team sport there more so than it seems to be anywhere else in the world what's that feeling for you and then how does that feeling translate to the Paralympic team as well I think just being a part of what we call the attacking Vikings and the mentality there uh, and it is kind of like uh, Chetland Omot said a couple of years ago that uh, alpine skiing is a team sport uh, apart from those two minutes you're on the hill uh, so I think just being a part of the same mentality and the same attacking Vikings have uh, have made us better in the Paralympic team uh, but also we have now three sit, sit, sit skiers here uh, so we're growing as a team uh, by ourselves as well uh, so I think it's cool that we also we have kind of two arenas. We can train with the Olympic guys uh, and uh, learn from them, uh, but uh, eventually we are we are our, our own team and have our own races. So we have to be be a good team there as well. Uh, but I think like the combination of having two arenas, one one you can look up to those guys and see them in training and stuff, and then you also have to find your your own uh, idols in the Paralympic uh, world. Uh, and uh, us as a team is uh, we're getting we're getting quite strong uh, but I remember watching uh, like the one Vancouver and the uh, Sochi Paralympics and seeing monoskiers for the first time uh, it was really amazing and yeah it's made uh, it's made me who I am today who are some of the people you look up to who are some of the monoskiers I remember 
especially from Sochi, uh, seeing Tyler Walker crashing quite hard there, uh, and Ooh, yeah. yeah, and also, but but then meeting him in the World Cup and eventually uh, beating him by uh, so little in the GS in uh, Pyeongchang, uh, it was it was like uh, yeah, it, a dream come true to be able to ski alongside those guys and eventually beat them. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd imagine that that is a part of it. And Tyler is a guy who, I mean, that, that crash in Sochi was one of the worst and one of the greatest fears, I think, that we have as yeah. mono skiers, where the shock is completely compressed. You hit the bump, you go up over the handlebars at 60, 70 miles an hour, whatever he was going. And it was crazy. I didn't, I didn't know if he was alive after that one. Crazy. honestly yeah it was it was amazing but he was such a such a great skier and you guys had a great battle in Pyeongchang as you said that for you in some ways was a bit of a surprise wasn't it Pyeongchang to I mean you're a GS guy right this is this is who you are I mean obviously you're you're one of the top guys if you're not the top guy you're the second guy in in every event right now but it sounds like your heart is really in GS was that a surprise in Pyeongchang to win that GS? I mean, uh, Pyeongchang was my first Paralympics. Uh, and uh, before Pyeongchang, I, I think I've won like four GS races uh, the same season. Uh, so it was my best discipline uh, there uh, going into the games. Uh, and uh, I remember in uh, the downhill, first downhill training, I had the fastest time. So every media in Norway was like, oh, he's going to win. And then... Then I came in like seventh or something, I think. So the hopes were a bit uh, up for the downhill, uh, but I don't have the like all the all the runs that you need to be on top there. Uh, but GS was really good for me in Pyeongchang, uh, and I think it's like it's the the basic event of uh, alpine skiing. Uh, if you if you manage to do good GS, you can do good slalom and you can do good super G and downhill as well. So to be, to, we train a lot of GS just to have the the basic yeah, movements and body ready. Yeah, it's interesting. GS is a really interesting sport in that when you first start ski racing, you generally start in giant slalom because the turns are a little bit bigger, but the speed is not as much as you have in the speed events. And so people can find their way down the course and you don't have to be super proficient. It's the in some ways, it's the easiest introduction to alpine skiing. But in other ways, it's the most difficult event to do really well. There's just so much speed and the technical part of being a giant slalom skier. Is that part of what appeals to you about giant slalom is like the problem solving aspect of it? Yeah, and you have to, you have to do a lot of GS training to be able to like find where in the turn you're supposed to start the turn and stuff because if you're if you lack the gs training then your timing is also a bit off so uh yeah, yeah you suddenly like too low on the line or too wide or too yeah everything it could go wrong and it's quite difficult to come out of uh, if you're like in a wrong if you're going the wrong way it's quite difficult to get out of it and start start fresh kind of uh, but I worked a lot with my coaches to find like the basic easy things to think about when when I'm kind of struggling uh, that in slalom as well <laughs> I have some periods in slalom that's not uh, too good uh, I think everybody has them and uh, yeah, it's just it's just important to think about make it easy and just uh, do do the easy things that you know work and then eventually you'll get out of it what are some of the things that you think about? Because we do have those, right? I mean, there are those keys that sort of unlock good skiing. You talked about line. There, there are times that it's easier, you know, if you look at the gate, it's easy to make the turn into the gate. And, and you know, I know there are people, and I've done it myself, where if you look at the rut as opposed to looking at the gate, you're going to give yourself that room to actually make one clean arc, which is the objective of ski racing. And when it's absolutely beautiful is when you link those arcs together. But you talked about when things go wrong, then trying to get back online 
is is really hard to find a way and especially like as a mono skier you don't have the ability to make this big horizontal move from one side to the other to get back online it's kind of like okay now we have to start up and do it slowly and kind of gate by gate we're getting back online what are some of the keys for you what are the things that you think about when you're skiing uh, you're so I'm, I'm an 11 uh, which is the like the middle factor uh, mm -hmm. so i have some i have all my abs uh, so right. i'm able to like go over the ski uh, so for me it's important in the start of the turn to have my inner outer gear uh, like forward and not lean into the in the turn of course uh, and uh, also just give me a bit of space uh, in GS, for example, just give me a, a bit of space from the gate. Don't go too close to the gate because then I'm not able to, to angle up my ski. Uh, so a bit, a bit, uh, a bit space from the gate and the uh, inner outrigger uh, forward and just, uh, yeah, take them, do the pressure, not all the pressure on the ski at once, but build up the pressure slowly and just go, full pressure when I'm out the gate and then, yeah. Mm. Well, it looks like that's something that when you're doing it well, that's what you do is, is not do too much at the, at the top of the turn. You have a little bit of a, it, it's kind of interesting the way you, the way you sort of, you sort of get into the turn. There's sort of a little, the, the little forward you're talking about the outrigger going forward, the head kind of comes in and then, and then comes back out over the, over the ski toward the middle of the turn where you, that's where you are, super strong is yeah. in the middle of the turn and being able to complete complete that turn which is where you're you're gaining your speed you've moved into some of the speed events though too i mean you said in, in pyeongchang you had the first you, you were first in the first training run but you also have done you know you, you've been successful in slalom i mean top ranked in slalom top ranked in gs i mean i think it's I think you might be be combined right now that you're that you're second ranked right, but right there, or maybe it's super G, uh, but but you're you're right at the top of the whole thing. Is GS still your favorite, or have you started to branch out, or is it a matter of which event you're skiing really well at the time that becomes your favorite? I think it's probably the last uh, because uh, when things work out in different uh, disciplines, then they might be my favorite. Uh, last season, uh, the slalom was quite good, uh, and this and in 2020, uh, I actually took my first downhill victories uh, in uh, Russia. Uh, that was that was an interesting trip, <laughs> but uh, that yeah, was interesting. Was Why was that interesting? Uh, for first of all, they had a 42 meter jump uh, at the start of the run, uh, like after two gates. It was, uh, I think I've never jumped that uh, far before. <laughs> and I think also I, I was the only sit skier that managed to land it because uh, I think we were five people at the start only. Uh, and uh, Kirka, he crashed hard in the first. Uh, first jump and uh, I struggled a bit as well uh, and uh, but I I won my first two downhill victories there uh, and it was it was cool and all the disciplines are are really working out when they're working out <laughs> and uh, sometimes uh, sometimes GS can be hard as well uh, I had a period uh, two years ago when it wasn't working quite as good as I hoped uh, but uh, I hope now that going into this season with both the world champs um, in Norway and the Beijing Paralympics, I'm able to compete for the the medals in every event. So slalom, you're talking about slalom too, which was interesting. I mean, we were talking about downhill as well, but but in slalom, one of the biggest challenges I find with the Paralympics, and yeah. it will probably be the same case in in the world championships is that suddenly you have a much bigger field than you usually have for a world cup. Everybody is going to show up at these events. And as a monoskier, it's not like being in the world cup where you get seated and you're in the top 15 or the top 30 or whatever, you're, you're running with triple digits on, on your chest, right? Which means that a lot of people have skied that course it is fully beaten up. I mean, it's. I really think that in a lot of ways, you're not a you're not a slalom skier. You become a mogul skier 
more than you are a slalom skier at, at the biggest events. How do you reconcile what you do in training, you know, where, where you have a more clean course and you're able to make those turns and get in on the gate and really run a straight line versus when you're going to be racing in the Paralympics. And I mean, look, Lillehammer, most likely you should be in good shape for the world championships because it should be pretty hard snow. So, uh, so it might not break down as much in January, but how do you, how do you take what you've done in training in slalom and then be able to apply that to the biggest event of the year when the conditions are entirely different than what you've prepared for? Yeah, I, as you say, it's difficult to prepare for those uh, race conditions when there's a lot of people at start. Uh, but uh, these last couple of uh, camps we've had in Austria, uh, we've trained together with uh, a lot of other people and teams. Uh, so we've trained uh, on having uh, courses that's not uh, like uh, just for me and my teammates, but for for a lot of people and then they got torn down a bit faster uh, and that's made them more like able to see more of the same as we will probably see in the Beijing uh, but uh, yeah slalom especially it's difficult because it gets it gets really interesting when it's race time uh, and uh, uh, you also see the mono skiers. Many of them have different techniques. Uh, so most people take the gates with the shoulder. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually take it with my outrigger now, uh, with my outer outrigger crossbow. Your outside outrigger, where you're yeah. clearing kind of the way that 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 a, a World Cup slalom skier does it with the outside hand. Yeah, it's kind of the same, uh, and it. Uh, First of all, it uh, stops me getting bruises all over my shoulders because that was an issue before with, uh, yeah, I looked like I was, <laughs> I, I didn't look that good after slalom sessions. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that has helped me to develop my technique in slalom a bit more uh, and being able to do that. Maybe I have, a, have an advantage uh, in those hard conditions, uh, but uh, we'll see in Beijing. And the, the balance is still because that's one of the things, right? Because if you're if you're using that out, outside outrigger to clear the gate, it means that you don't have to ski through it, which is one of the issues. And for a lot of the athletes, they're taking it underneath their inside arm, which has a tendency to yank you around. And, and you know, so if it catches there, then your ski comes across the hill. But then even with the outside outrigger, you're talking about having balance issues where especially if it's super bumpy and you have that outrigger up as opposed to kind of being completely completely solid in your over your ski it makes a bit of a challenge is is that as as profound a challenge for you as it appears for me or uh, it you are a bit more vulnerable uh, but you have to you have to trust in your ski uh, and not lean on your inner outrigger but like uh, have that the uh, yeah, not not lean on it, the inner outrigger and uh, just uh, when the speed is kind of high uh, it's not that that big of an issue with the uh, with the balance uh, but of course when it's more when the when it's more worn torn out the courses it's worse but uh, yeah it works for me uh, but you have to train a lot of it to be able to do it to be comfortable and and that's that's the yeah. nature of what you're doing and the nature of ski racing is that you're ingraining those movements and the most successful i mean and we saw it with odermott at at solden this past weekend where the most successful skiers are the ones who are the most technically sound at the time when it's most critical i mean it's easy for everybody to ski technically sound you know, on, on easy parts of the course, but when it's really difficult, that's when it's the challenge. And that's even with the outrigger, it, it gets back to you've got to do with your hips and your shoulders. You can't let that outrigger affect what happens with the rest of your body. And and that's that's the definition of skiing in so many ways. Do you know what to expect in Beijing? Usually you have a pre Paralympics the year before. These are brand new mountains or brand new venues. Do you know anything of what to expect there? 
Yeah, that's uh, that's really really an issue uh, because uh, before the Pyeongchang we had the World Cup, World Cup uh, finals uh, in Pyeongchang in the same hills uh, the year before, uh, but now we know quite little of what we're expecting. Uh, we've seen some footage of the of the hills uh, and it looks uh, quite cool, uh, but we know. We don't know anything about like the weather conditions, if it's going to be hot or cold or... That was actually an issue in Pyeongchang because when the Olympic team was there, it was quite cold. And then when we had our last days, it was uh, pretty warm. So they had to salt the courses, I think. So that made, that made it quite difficult. And when we're a lot of people, it tears the courses more as well. So... I'm excited for Beijing, and it looks uh, it looks really interesting. Especially the the speed courses. It looks uh, quite. It's a lot of terrain and a lot of edges. So I'm uh, really looking forward to it. And uh, of course, in Lillehammer, we have uh, we've trained there a lot, and uh, we're ready for what what meets us there. So, yeah. So so you'll have World Championships in Lillehammer in January. And then yeah. you'll have the Paralympics in Beijing in March. You and your father had always had a had a dream to bring to bring the World Cup and the World Championships back to back to Lillehammer. So this is kind of kind of a dream, but it's got to be a bit better bittersweet, right? Because your father died in November of 2020. Is that right? Yeah, he did. So that was a big blow for me and my family. Of course, uh, he got a heart attack uh, and died suddenly. Uh, so it's, it's has always been me and my father uh, doing skiing. He took me out skiing first time when I was two years old. Uh, so yeah, it, he's been a big part of my journey and now I have to like continue without him. Uh, but I'm, I'm ready for the world champs and uh, hopefully I'm going to win some medals and honor him. Exactly. I mean, that's the biggest way that you can honor him. What was what was his background in skiing? He had actually quite a little uh, background from skiing, uh, but uh, he he always had like a cabin up in the mountains with his family. And uh, yeah, it's just uh, he was actually a goalkeeper himself in soccer. Uh, so he played soccer for most time. And uh, yeah, my mom and dad liked going up to the mountains and wanted me to have the opportunity to be able to feel the way they felt about the mountains and they figured out sit skiers. Sit skiing was something that could work out for me. So, yeah, that I've been quite lucky because there's not many people who would take their two-year-old uh, child <laughs> in a wheelchair <laughs> to try sit skiers. So... I've been lucky and uh, hopefully yeah, I've been able to do some good things in the champ world champs and uh, in Beijing. But you said he didn't have, he was a goalkeeper. He didn't have much experience in skiing, but it seemed like he, he, he accumulated some experience in skiing and helped, helped you along the way. Cause he was, he was your coach in a lot of ways too, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. So of course, when you, uh, he's probably seen me ski uh, a lot of hours. Uh, so you learn what to look at and uh, how to coach me. And of course, uh, being a dad and a coach is quite a difficult combination. Uh, so it, it was good to have other coaches as well, because I tend to listen <laughs> a bit more to them <laughs> talking about skiing than my dad. Uh, but uh, of course, he, he knew what he did. And he also, we, growing up in the, on the coast, uh, we had to drive a lot of hours together to be able to go to the mountains. And he always said that I had to, in training, I always had to like ski the whole course and the last gate uh, with full intensity because uh, if not there was no point driving such a long way to to ski if you're i'm not uh, doing it with 100 uh, percent passion uh, so that's been difficult it's been uh, really important for me to do what i do 100 percent and uh, not give up before before i do what i want to do so you have to fight the whole way i would imagine that those the coaching sessions in those in those two hour drives back and forth from the coast to the to the mountains were probably 
some of the most formative part of your of your skiing career in some ways yeah and yeah i learned a lot on those uh, road trips and uh, the skiing there was uh, yeah, it was a big part of me and uh, now i'm uh, yeah i have to do a lot of those kind of logistical things by myself uh, so there are a bit more to think about around it but uh when I'm in the course, I, I always want to give 100% and uh, do make him proud. Yeah, and that makes sense. I mean, you said that the, the greatest lesson from your father is finishing finishing the race, which is which is also, you said, applied to the rest of your life as well, is, is finishing strong, even if things are difficult, finding a way to finish finish strong. Do you feel like, like the memory of him, the uh, being able to honor him, does that make you stronger on the hill too? It certainly gives me uh, some more like uh, like will to be able to ski fast. Uh, and of course, I want to honor him in the best possible way. Uh, and uh, next season is a good way to do it. Uh, but uh, of course, it's of course, I want to do my best in the in the courses, and thinking of him could both be like positive and negative uh, in some ways. Uh, but I I hope I could like turn it into strength and uh, be able to ski even faster. Where will you be racing in Lillehammer? Will you be at Kitfjell or Hafjell or? Uh, all the events are taking place at Hafjell. At Hafjell, okay. Yeah. So that's where we raced back in 1994. So I know it well. <laughs> yeah, it's a cool course with a lot of uh, steep parts and some technical parts. You have to you have to be smart in. So it's a cool place, and uh, of course, having two championships in the same season is going to be really. It's going to be hectic <laughs> for sure, uh, but. Last season in the Corona season, uh, we were out in the in the Alps for five weeks in one go. Uh, so that gave us some some uh, way to handle being together for so for such a long period of time. Uh, so I think we're gonna be able to yeah to stand the pressure and uh, be fast both in the half year and Beijing. Now you have you've been really successful recently. You've won four globes, the last the last four overall titles. You're you're ranked either at or near the top of everything. Uh, what what are your expectations? I mean, you're talking about the challenge of of one having a world championships, and then a month later having having the Paralympics. What are you what are you hoping for as you're going into the world championships? As you're going into the into the uh, into the Paralympics as well. Of course, uh, I'm not the only one skiing, uh, so it's going to be a hard fight between maybe especially me and Jerome Kampfer from the Netherlands, uh, and also Rene de Silvestro from Italy looks uh, strong. Uh, so I think we're a few guys who's able to fight on the top, and I can't just go there to to get my gold medals so i have to fight for them uh, but uh, of course going into the season having won the world cup overall four years in a row uh, it's it makes me uh, think that i'm quite strong and uh, want to fight for the top positions of course uh, but uh, i think our goal now is set for one goal and being able to fight for more goals and uh, in both the uh, Beijing and Hafia. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm just looking forward to the games, really. I think we have trained a lot and uh, are ready to do our best there. Uh, and uh, hopefully it's going to lead to some medals. Hopefully it's going to, well, that's, that's the hard part, right? I mean, you can prepare as best you can. You hope to have a good day when it matters and you hope that your good day is better than the next guy's good day. You mentioned Jaron and, and Silvestro. Th those are the people that you really are looking at as, as rivals in, in all five events because you'll be running slalom, giant slalom, super G, downhill, and then the combined. Yeah, and in the world champs, we're also going to have a parallel slalom. 
Uh, yeah. So that's a new event. So it's six events in the World Champs. So that's going to be fun. Uh, but of course, add those two. And uh, of course, you have uh, Andrew Kirka from Alaska who can do some good things in speed uh, once in a while. <laughs> we'll see how he's trained uh, before the season. But uh, yeah, there are some people. You have Kurt Oatway from Canada and uh, some Japanese guys. And yeah, so there are a lot of guys who can compete on a good day for the goals and you never know in world in in championships because uh, suddenly some guy could have the day of his life and uh, go faster than ever so i just have to do what i've done in training recently and stick to my consistency and try to be as fast as i can and i can't do anything about the, what my opponent do, does so i just have to focus on myself and try to Ski as fast as I can. What does race day look like for you? What do you, how, how, can you talk us through what happens on race day and what you're, what you're thinking or what you're hoping to think on race day? Uh, we, being from Norway, uh, we have, uh, we, we train a lot of, on a glacier called Folgefona uh, in summer. Uh, and there we can meet all kinds of weather. So I think one of my strengths is that I could use every condition and weather as a as like uh, something that's uh, in my favor uh, so I could use I think the my like my I've set my instincts on just thinking that everything could be turned into favor for me uh, and uh, of course uh, depending on uh, and the weather and stuff uh, many people's mentality may may differ a bit so so i think that's uh, something that i could benefit from uh, and of course uh, all race days look kind of the same uh, we wake up way too early and go to breakfast and uh, look at the courses and find with the coaches and find the things to focus on uh, and uh, of course all all co or co all courses are different uh, so we have to find those uh, those um, dif difficult points that you have to focus on and uh, just do what you do in training really is there anything that you do to get yourself into the moment of the race i mean you want to ski the way that you've prepared right which which sounds relatively easy but it's interesting i mean like i was talking to ted Ligeti, uh earlier this year and he was talking about how how a lot of people race slower than they train, which yeah, can be a real challenge, right? Yeah. That's been an issue for me as well, because all point skiing is a lot about the uh, physical things, of course, but uh, also the head is uh, quite important. Uh, so if you had, does not have like the game head, you, you don't have a chance. So you have to, Try to do what you do in training. It's easy to say it, uh, but it's not as easy to do it. Uh, I've figured out. So, yeah, uh, I've struggled a bit with that in my early days as well, just to find the right uh, tension and be able to do what I do in training. Uh, but uh, I think one of the most important things for me is uh, having like the same, the same. Uh, things before the start at every race like your routine, uh, you, my routine. routine. yeah uh, i warm up uh with my coach the same way each time uh, i go through the course with her uh try to like tell her my plan and we set a plan together and uh just uh, just uh, have the same routine all the time i think that's important to to be able to find the right tension in your body and be able to ski as fast as you can. Right. Because that's, the, that is the challenge for everybody that you get to an important event and suddenly you want to do things differently yeah. because it's important and which takes you completely away from everything you've prepared to do. But then if you just do it the way you've always done it, sometimes you think, well, I'm not putting enough effort into it. I need to put more effort. This is really important. And, and, and it sounds like you've been able to, to reconcile that with yourself, to be able to say, no, my preparation, I've done the preparation. And now are, are you able to have fun 
in, in, in the race part of it? Is it work? Is it fun? What's the, what's the aspect there? Of course it's fun, but uh, it's, it's a bit uh, difficult because training is just more, it's kind of more fun. And when you come to race, you have to, you have to do what you have done in training and not try to do anything different because that's something I've uh, done a couple of time, times myself uh, to try to do something extraordinary uh, in races, something you haven't tried in training yet. And uh, nine out of 10 times that doesn't work out because you have to, you have to do what you've trained a lot of times in. Uh, and uh, I think we have uh, 150 days of skiing uh, by until now uh, this year. So we, we ski a lot and uh, I think I just have to stick with the, what I do in training. Uh, and it's, it's easy to say that because uh, when you come to race day, uh, there's always some factors you, doesn't, you don't know about. Uh, so I think it's just important to be able to handle everything that comes your way and uh, try to do what you have you've, uh, done in training. Now you have two big events this year, World Championships, Paralympics. When you won the gold in Pyeongchang in 2018, suddenly people knew who you were. Like you're, how much did your life change by becoming a gold medalist? It changed a, a lot, I would say, because uh, when you, it opened some doors for you when you have the Paralympic gold to show for. So. Uh, of course, people recognize me a bit more on the streets now, uh, and that's cool. Uh, but also, yeah, just uh, you get invited to more talk shows and stuff like that. And that also helps with the kind of uh, personal sponsors and and those kind of thing, uh, things. Because uh, there's, uh, until now, there haven't been any... Uh, price money uh, in uh, paralpine skiing uh, and that's uh, quite a shame I think uh, because uh, we we train as hard as the able-bodied and we do kind of the same things so I hope that uh, yeah, we could try to make our sport a bit more up in the media and uh, show people what we do because it's really cool uh, so I think yeah, I think we we're on the right path now, uh, and the the world champs in Norway is actually going to be the first world champs where it's going to be prize money. Uh, so uh, that's uh, going to be a big uh, a big step on the right path for our uh, for alpine skiing. So prize money at world championships, how much prize money? Do you know how much prize money? And can you can you translate? I mean, are, are you guys on euros? Are you still on kroners? Or uh, still on kroners? Uh, I think uh, I think they've said about uh, hundred thousand euros total uh, for the whole whole okay. game. So that it has to be divided into the different disciplines, of course. Uh, but but it's a start and. Uh, and of course, uh, it isn't as much as uh, the able-bodied uh, gets. But uh, I had uh, last season. I I had a story with uh, a cheese I won in uh, Switzerland uh, because uh, we always get the raclette cheese in, in Switzerland. Uh, and I I posted it on my Instagram story and asked if anybody wanted to buy it. And uh, it, got, it, it became a big story in Norway. And I was invited to a lot of talk shows uh, because uh, yeah, people weren't aware of the fact that uh, we have such uh, such limited budgets and stuff like that, uh, uh, apart from the, the able body. So it has become a big story. And that was part of the reason why they decided to have prize money in the world champs now. Really? So yeah. you selling your cheese helped to bring prize money into the world championships. How much did you sell your cheese for? I think it went for around 5,000 euros. So that's, uh, that's pretty decent for a cheese. <laughs> that's some expensive cheese. Yeah, it is. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Uh, so, so, so now you have the prize money and the thing is, I mean, a lot of people don't understand that, right? I mean, are, are you getting, so, so the funding is a challenge, like a lot of your funding, a lot of, you know, not only just how you get to camps, how you get to races, 
how you buy equipment or whatever you have to buy. It's also you know, food, housing, car, those kinds of things. A lot of that comes from sponsorship. Do you get do you get support from the government in addition to the sponsorship, or how does that work for you specifically? Uh, we get a, a stipendium from the Olympic Training Center, uh, mm -hmm. so and the feder the ski federation funds the race trips and stuff like that. Uh, but it is kind of a full time job uh, with no actual pay. So uh, and. I also have some uh, local sponsors, uh, which uh, helps a lot. Uh, but uh, uh, right now, I'm also a full-time student, uh, so I'm a full-time skier and a full-time student. So, it I think it's important for para athletes now to be able to live at once uh, after the race career ends. Uh, so I have to like try to be able to. Yeah, be ready for life after skiing, uh, as well as I'm skiing. Uh, so uh, I hope that uh, I'm able to find a job afterwards. <laughs> I'm sure you'll be able to find a job, but it is, it really is a challenge. I mean, especially when you put your heart and soul into, into your sport and, and it's not like you're getting rich necessarily in this sport. So then when you, when you finish, to make that transition to whatever is next after it's, it's not an easy horizontal step, which is a challenge. What kind of, what kind of, like you said, you have some local sponsors, what kind of, what kind of sponsors do you have just so that people have an idea of like how you're able to, to pay the bills or to, or to travel on your own or, you know, buy some cheese. If you actually have to buy your own cheese, if you don't win it. <laughs> uh, it's uh, just the, uh, from, I'm from quite a small uh, town uh, on the coast, as we've talked about, uh, and uh, there are some uh, some businesses there uh, who wants to sponsor me. So I got some uh, some stuff from them, uh, and of course uh, we have the federation now uh, who gives us uh, some uh, stipendiums. But uh, I hope that yeah with the cheese story and the, the world champs uh, being in Norway and getting on live television, a lot of it uh, is going to be, uh, get, get us to the next level and be able to, to let us uh, live more like able-bodied athletes because it's, it's difficult uh, when they have, uh, uh, yeah, they have a lot of bigger budgets than us and uh, are able to do their skiing without, thinking about the, the things that comes up to skiing right exactly and what are you what are you studying i'm studying political science uh so it's a lot to read but it's uh, kind of interesting uh, <laughs> a part of the times as well uh, at least and uh last season actually last season i actually had a uh, a subject about the american elections uh, so yeah so that was quite interesting it was that we had a very interesting election. This, yeah, this yeah. last election, there was probably a, a lot to learn. That's like a whole, a whole history of what could happen possibly in elections during that. I mean, with, with, yeah, refusing, refusing to honor the election and, and those yeah. kinds of things. I mean, it's great to yeah. study. And you, you didn't have to like read a lot, all of the books. You could just watch, watch the news. And that's, uh, that's the fun part of it. <laughs> That's the fun part. Well, you're you're just about to head to Pitstall in Austria to go train. How long will you be in Pitstall on the on the glacier there? Uh, we'll be in Pitstall for twelve days, and then we'll come back for two weeks, and then we go back again to Pitstall uh, for the first Europe Cup races, uh, and then we do the Europe Cup races, and then there's some World Cup races in the middle of December. And that's it. So you want to be, I mean, this is, this is the ramping up period. You've done a lot of, a lot of training. You need to be on top of your game for the middle of December, but then the middle of January is when you have world championships. So it's going to come fast and furious for you. Yeah, it's going to come fast and you have to be ready for all the races. And I'm going to use the first races to get like into it because of course the, the big things are coming after Christmas. Uh, so you have to be ready for that. And, uh, but I think like this fall, we've done two weeks of skiing and two weeks at home, two weeks of skiing, uh, four times now. Uh, so I feel well prepared and ready to do my best. 
Yeah, and equipment is is all is all in good shape right now. Yeah, or uh, actually, my shock absorber uh, exploded last camp, so I took it with me home because uh, I've jumped a bit too much. So <laughs> we're fixing it now, and then hopefully it's going to be ready to to leave on Sunday. Okay, and so hopefully nobody takes your skis out of the garage and leaves them on the side of the road up the hill. <laughs> yeah, that would be a shame. <laughs> I guess that happened once, right? Yeah, it did. Uh, it was uh, we were skiing uh, uh, some places in Norway, and uh, there was a bit kind of some people who partied a bit too much, and they saw some way ski in the garage and figured out they wanted to take it with them. So that was one way to do it. We found it though, but so that was uh, a happy ending to the story. Exactly. No, that's definitely a happy ending. Well, it sounds like you've been doing some great work and there's a lot ahead of you right now, but we look forward to seeing you both at the World Championships and then then at the at the Paralympics in Beijing when you will not be the only one who doesn't really know exactly what's going on. Maybe the Chinese athletes will have had a chance to get on the course, but probably no one else will have a chance to get on the course prior to the Games. Yeah, that's uh, a bit crazy. And uh, but apart from the Chinese, everybody's uh, are in the same position. So we'll just have to figure out how it is and go with the flow. Exactly. And you'll also luckily have the benefit of watching the Olympics yeah. prior to the Paralympics. So you'll be studying, I would imagine, the courses as, as you watch it on television. Yeah, and uh, of course, being in the same team as or uh, a part of the attacking Vikings, then I could uh, ask uh, Chet Leonsrud and the guys for some tips, probably. So I have to use that uh, for my yeah to be able to ski as fast as I can. Exactly, and you're not gonna you're not gonna grow a beard like like Leonsrud and Svindal and those guys, or what's going on there? Nah, not yet. I think <laughs> I'll think I'll wait a couple of years. <laughs> All right. Yes, Bert, thanks so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. I look forward to watching you. I look forward to getting the opportunity to talk about your skiing and appreciate your skiing while, we're, while I'm doing some of the analysis for NBC. And best of luck to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Exactly. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. We hope you've enjoyed this. The greatest gift you can give to us is to tell your friends to tune in to check it out. We will have more Paralympic athletes like Jesper as we lead into the Beijing Games. This will become a, a regular podcast. It'll be on YouTube. It'll be on Apple. It'll be on Spotify. You can check in. The greatest gift you can give us is to follow us, to like us, and as we said before, to tell your, to tell your friends. So thank you all so much, and we'll look forward to seeing you the next time.